All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight. Um, before we get started, I want to um, you know, mention a few upcoming lectures. So uh, already on uh, Monday, uh, March 6th, uh, we have our Ruth and Norman Moore um, visiting faculty, Anna and Eugeni Bach, um, lecturing. So please come out for that. Uh, really looking forward to that one. Um, and then uh, April 1st, uh, Francis Carre. Um, so we're still working out uh, the logistics of that, where that one will be located. Um, so just kind of keep in tune for that. Um, and then later in April, um, we have um, uh, Michael um, uh, Roiken. So we're really looking forward to him coming as well. So uh, tonight, um, welcome to the annual Coral Courts Lecture. We want to thank uh, Karina Kotzen and her husband, uh, Lee Rosenbaum, who established this annual lecture in 1995. Uh, uh, Kotzen earned her uh, degrees in architecture and construction management from Washington University in 1983. She entered the field of construction management and founded Edifice Complex. Uh, she resides in Santa Monica, California with her husband and children. Uh, and their daughter, uh, Chiara, uh, graduated from Washington University in 2015. Uh, Kotzen mother, Kotzen's mother, uh, Joanne Stolorov Kotzen, studied fashion design at Washington University. And Karina uh, serves as a trustee of Washington University and chair of the Los Angeles Regional Cabinet and member of the Sam Fox School National Council. Um, and we're uh, really happy to have uh, Karina with us here tonight. So. All right. So, don't let them see you sweat. I can't help think of that when I see the work of Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee. Um, it starts with an intense dedication to cultural production. Uh, they are practitioners educators, authors, uh, and contributing uh, greatly to the field of architecture and the arts. Uh, together, they founded Johnson Mark Lee in 1998, um, several years after graduating from Harvard's GSD. Uh, Sharon Johnson is a professor of practice at Harvard GSD, uh, has taught at Princeton University uh, and UCLA, and she held the Cullinan Chair at Rice University and the Frank Gehry International Chair at the University of Toronto. Uh, Mark Lee is currently the Chair of the Architecture Department at Harvard GSD and a professor in practice. Uh, he has previously taught at uh, UCLA, uh, TU Berlin, also School of Architecture in the ETH in Zurich. Um, and he held the Cullinan Chair at Rice University and the Frank Gehry International Chair at University of Toronto. In 2017, um, they published uh, House is a House is a House is a House is a House, uh, a book on a series of seminal houses that they completed that helped define their practice. Um, uh, they also have several monographs uh, on their work, uh, 2G, L Croquis, and A plus U. Uh, also in 2017, they were the artistic uh, directors of this Chicago Architecture uh, Biennale. Um, they have completed 14 uh, or projects in 14 countries for clients such as the Menil Collection, the Museum of Contemporary Art, uh, UCLA, the Graduate Art Studios, and Dropbox. Um, they have too many awards to list, uh, so I'm, I'm not even going to try. It's over 50. Um, uh, and the firm's uh, work is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Menil Collection, San Francisco Museum of uh, Modern Art, Carnegie Museum of Art, and the Architecture Museum at TU Munich. Um, their projects have a, a real clarity of organization and subtle yet strong, uh, sometimes primitive forms and sometimes using subtractive techniques. Uh, there is a, simultaneously a sophistication that is revealed while there's a sense of the familiar, yet not quite. Um, but I think 
going back to where I started, there's an ease to which their work appears. Um, the minimalist details look easy at first, but there's a lot of work behind the scenes to achieve that level of abstraction. Don't be fooled by the appearance. There's plenty of sweat that happens in the office to ensure the clarity of geometry, the play of light, the view lines, and programmatic organization. But you won't see it from Sharon and Mark. So please help me welcome uh, Sharon Johnson and Mark Lee. Thanks, Chanda. Thank you. Uh, could you could you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the generous introduction, Chandler. When Chandler first invited us to come to lecture, we asked uh, not to come in the summer because we don't want to sweat. <laughs> but, uh, but thank you. Thank you again. We, we're honored here to present our work here in honor of Karina Kotsum because besides being a distinguished alumna and uh, advocate of the school, she's also a friend and a neighbor. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the swim teacher who taught Karina how to swim also taught our daughter how to swim, you know, who, who's turning 18 today. So a shout out to our daughter, Lily. And uh, this is my first time here at Wash U. Uh, Sharon has lectured here 10 years ago, but the school has been close to my heart. And one of the reasons is that uh, one of my uh, important teacher for me uh, in my undergraduate years, his name is Frank Dimster. He was a student here in the 60s. Uh, he won a, a Stearman Fellowship here in 1968. And uh, he, all the time he talked about studying with Fumihiko Maki, Aldo Van Eyck. You know, the school always carry a certain mystique for me, so I'm uh, delighted to be here. Um, uh, you know, and being career-long practitioners and educators, you know, we take great pleasure in sharing our work uh, uh, and our thinking with students uh, because beginnings are very important for us. So uh, pertaining to beginnings, we would like to start our lecture by sharing a quote from T.S. Eliot, as you know, the grandson of the founder of Wash U that has been important for us. And Eliot says, uh, we shall never cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring, we will, be, we will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time, end quote. Thank you. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I think that's good. So um, following on uh, with the theme of beginnings, we thought we could introduce you a little bit to our practice before um, presenting our, our work um, with a few autobiographical notes and our earliest projects in Marfa, Texas. And I think what's most important about these early works is um, the community of people that we um, began to get to know and work on projects together with from single family houses, working with very local um, builders, uh, with families who are really investing in the culture and the history of Marfa. Um, from those early days, we um, you know, met many friends, many artists, people who um, have become lifelong friends, collaborators, and clients, working on all different scales of projects from ex exhibition designs, to producing uh, galleries um, across LA. And I think these early gallery projects, which were largely adaptive reuse um, of existing warehouses, kind of on the periphery, the sort of forgotten corners of Los Angeles, gave us the chance, while working at such a relatively small scale, to, to think about the role of architecture in a city like Los Angeles. Um, and so the arts, you know, more and more today are thriving in Los Angeles. And these early projects um, were an opportunity to think about how um, the roles of, of galleries, art production places, like the image on the left is the Sam Francis um, studio, Lapis Press, um, or Arcana Books, how all of these outposts start to form a constellation that is the undercurrent of culture in Los Angeles. We also have had the chance to work on many exhibitions. Um, here we get to work with curators, in the case of Laszlo Mahalinaj, really going deeply into the art historical content of the work and trying to create environments that help bring those thematics to life spatially. Um, and also with contemporary living artists like James Welling, an artist that we've had the chance to work with on many different projects in different contexts where um, we find relationships between his work, his ideas about space in a gallery presentation. Um, Takeshi Murakami. Um, so this kind of ecology of projects um, across all those scales is really what is the kind of nourishing um, mind um, food of how we think about our projects today. And that kind of work led to um, small private museums um, here giving us the chance to really hone our craft, not only on construction, but also thinking about 
daylight and the, and the reciprocity between um, the domestic um, and a space of exhibition. And lastly, I think um, thinking about arts in the public realm, which we'll talk about tonight and the way that um, pr uh, collaborative projects like biennials where we have the chance to think about small scale buildings and the way that they intersect um, with a larger culture of a city um, that is often in transformation um, like, like this case um, from the biennial in Shanghai in 2013. And uh, I, I would say, I think one of the most important common denominators of, for type for us is the single family house. You know, as we're working on larger scale projects in the last 10 years or so, I think it was very important for us to keep on working on small scale projects because it really uh, keep us in tune with the human scale. You know, I think as we work on museum scale projects and, and, and such, so, you know, as Shen mentioned, we started off working with artists, you know, designing their studios, uh, then we begin to design houses for the collectors. You know, so this scale of, of, of practice is very important for us, not only thinking about how the house fits within a, a, a densely growing neighborhood, but also the relationship between the interior and the exterior, the, the use of natural light and such. And, and those who have been to Los Angeles or know about uh, the history of architecture of Los Angeles, you know, really for many years, it's been the history of single family houses. Recent years, we certainly have really world-class museums and such, but for decades, it's really the single-family house that defined uh, the history of Los Angeles architecture. And uh, in 1970, Rainer Banham published his book, Architecture of Four Ecologies. Uh, certainly, a lot has changed in Los Angeles since 1970, but I think the physiognomy of the landscape, you know, the, the hillside, the beachfront, you know, the plains, uh, the importance of cars are still very relevant. So, the many houses that we designed really were thinking about that as a prototype. Like, what does it mean by building on a hillside that is constantly being densifying? How do we work with a very small footprint with a very expansive interior? It's a very different notion of the case study houses where the interior and exterior kind of blends together, but more about how a very defined envelope, people are getting more privatized, neighbors are getting closer and closer to one another, how we maintain that privacy, but still preserve this type of expansiveness or relationship to the exterior. Now, this is a house in Rosario, Argentina. So it's not Los Angeles, but we're certainly thinking about suburbia, thinking about the plains. As we designed the house, we were thinking preemptively, thinking about the future neighbors, where they will be, and where the windows would somehow bypass them, so we're not looking into another neighbor's house, but, but by looking in between. Uh, the analogy is really about uh, uh, like uh, a subway you know, in Tokyo, where you're very close to one another. Where do you find the gaps to visually connect to someplace further? You know, so uh, this house was very much about that. It's called the view house, and how one circulates around the house, and at the end, walk up to the top of the, hill, of the, the, the roof garden, and have this panoramic view of the, um, of the Pampas. So this is the, this is the vault house. This is a beach typology. You know, and like many Southern California beach sites, you know, a lot of these houses are packed very tightly, like sardines. You know? This one, when it was built, didn't have a neighbor adjacently, but now there is one. Uh, all these sites are very long and narrow. And most people would put their living room and their master bedroom facing the beach, which are great for those rooms. But the rest of the house tends to be dark and dank, and you know, you enter the house in between houses in an unceremonious way. So for us, working on this house is really about bringing as much light and air as deep into the house as possible. So a lot has to do with creating a courtyard, even carving out uh, the, the walkway to walk into the middle of the house, ascend up to an open courtyard to bring light and air into the middle of the house. And then really all the rooms are organized as vaults. They're open on both ends, but uh, connected to the ocean. You know, certainly we're thinking about the, um, the Spanish colonial tradition, Urban Gill, you know, that, that type, but think of it in a, in a very modern way and eventually end up in this uh, double height space. Uh, looking back, you know, you can see the master bedroom on the top has to look through this double height space to be connected to the beach. By the way, there was a restaurant named Rebecca's by Frank Gehry that has been since torn down. But these two fish lamps used to be there, and they dismantled the restaurant and auctioned. We're so happy to get this for our client and bring, bring the fishes back to the, back to the beach again. <laughs> yeah. and so this is really at the end of the house facing the street, with the back of the photographer towards the street. But here, you can still see that direct connection to visually and also with airflow towards the beach and the ocean. 
So this is a house that was just completed in Kyoto in, in, in Japan. We haven't even seen ourselves. This is the first time we showed this house publicly. Uh, it is right on a canal, a small canal that used to bring the water into Kyoto. Also on the roof has a view of the mountains where every year they have this ceremony where they burn a, 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 a Japanese character, kanji character on the top of the hill. And we certainly have been looking at this mariachi window, this traditional Japanese window that has a, as a type, you know, with, with a, typically a more uh, 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 timber construction, uh, but translated that into concrete. So it's really a terrace type, but the windows are really slightly focusing downwards, and you look towards the canal. Um, inside is really organized around a triple height courtyard uh, that brings light and also this continuous stair that brings you all the way up. And it's a, a second home for a client who lives in Tokyo, but uh, wants to spend a lot of time in Kyoto and had beautiful uh, uh, um, cherry blossoms, you know, right in front of the canal. Great. So I, I think Mark's um, really well articulated the importance of the house and the kind of sense of the domestic um, in our understanding of space. And I think for us, I think working at the scale of the house always grounds us in thinking about the sort of intimacy of, of space and what it means to just be a kind of single person in a space and never forgetting the importance of that, whether we're designing a museum or a school, that it, that is really um, the DNA of everything that we do. And so tonight we're going to be talking about our work in the arts. And I think studying uh, cultural buildings has really given us a chance to think about um, the relationship of architecture in the city. Oftentimes we work at maybe you know, intermediate scale buildings that we're looking both at them as single works of architecture, but how they embed themselves and create a kind of continuity or constellation of buildings and spaces across the city. And I think for us, thinking about architecture in that way, inhabiting a generous public realm is, is really critical because it allows us to think about a kind of in-between scale between building and architecture, between urbanism and, and, um, and the intimacy of a room. And it's that kind of in-betweenness that we um, really thrive on and find a compelling way to, to frame projects um, in the city or within a campus. So um, I'm going to start by talking about a couple of uh, selection of buildings that are really about arts and education in some way. And so the first one is a project that's under construction now for the Whitney Museum. The Whitney's um, on the west side of Manhattan, and that small red square that you see south on Washington is going to be the permanent home for an important um, program called the Whitney Independent Study Program. And here it was a, in a building donated by Roy and Dorothy Lichtenstein. It was an old factory that we're adapting um, for a space um, for arts education. So we're very much preserving this historic building, stitching it, maintaining its kind of presence in the, in the city but also framing um, this open space in the case of a terrace um, that was designed by Roy, um, but always thinking about open space and built space together. Within the building, it's a very sort of light touch, so we're thinking of lightly how we can inhabit this building with a new use for the um, artist studios, creating, um, on the one hand, really honoring the structure and order of the residential building on this floor, but, but, but at the same time, finding new, new rooms, new scales, um, new kind of a space between furniture and architecture as a way to inhabit the space um, over time. Uh, in Chicago, we um, so this is an ongoing project that's morphed in many different directions, but this was um, our competition uh, entry that won for the Green Line Arts Center that was um, become a kind of ongoing project with the Astor Gates. So just west of the University of Chicago campus on um, Garfield Avenue, really sort of an almost an empty block, but a block that Theaster has been working on to restore um, to varying degrees. And many of you guys might be familiar with his work kind of inhabiting um, historic buildings that were left empty, the Stony Island Arts Bank, among many others. So this idea of a sort of almost a ghost use that is, allows for a building to re-inhabit it, be re-inhabited in a new way. So the Green Line Arts Center is a community space and um, a performing arts building. So I, I think a thematic that you'll see in these projects is, is oftentimes a hybrid of sort of different programs. And it's that kind of energy that in the way they come together that is um, where we find a lot of um, design intensity in the work. So working within a historic building facade that we preserve, sort of slipping in a very simple um, modular structure that evokes both a domestic scale and also the industrial factories that are left on the south side of Chicago. 
working very much at the scale of the block, but thinking about a typology um, of construction that is repeatable and modular and such that we sort of form an icon for this building that's both really part of the fabric of the city, but at, at the same time starts to emerge as something um, slightly different at a slightly intermediate scale. Very simple um, bay system that allows for theaters, um, black box performance, rehearsals, all of that to happen simultaneously, but also to be transformed into one sort of singular large 8,000 square foot footprint. I think what's important about the building urbanistically is that we introduce a, a, a kind of more radical idea about transparency in a place that you might often think of one would want to be defensive. We open the building up and look at layers of program and defined by different climatic zones. So these in between winter gardens are both programmatically indeterminate but climatically important to modulate temperature in the winter and the summer. And are also really make the building very porous and welcoming such that the front and the back of the building are reciprocally welcoming um, to um, folks in the community. So it's really at one level a host structure that um, is inhabited inside and out and has that, um, in, a, in a way, a kind of abstraction about its order. And that base system, we imagined an idea that it could project across the entire block, forming informal stages, workshops, and such in um, warmer weather. In uh, Southern California for UCLA and a sort of important historic part of the city called the Hayden Track, um, an industrial um, quarter where UCLA had their MFA program, so not dissimilar to part of the program here. And they'd owned the building since the mid 80s, um, but over time it had evolved with sort of two different layers of kind of urban architecture from these sort of iconic buildings of Eric Moss to this still a few remaining sort of almost um, very undetermined warehouse buildings that in a way define Southern California, maybe a little bit more south now in Orange County, um, but are still a part of the landscape of LA, largely tilt-up construction. So the new graduate art studios building um, preserves and sort of readapts the warehouse, which is at the top of the plan, and then we add a new addition, which is some of the lar largely collective spaces. So the warehouse is a neighborhood of studios, and the new labs and more public shared buildings wrap around the street. It's a kind of a very blank, blank facade, except for the subtle pillowing of the tilt-up concrete walls and the kind of thin cornice that introduce perhaps a new scale that's different than the warehouses, and it being the only um, academic building in, in the area, it has a sort of surreal quality of being both of the fabric, but slightly a different, at a different scale. You enter the building through a garden. Um, the uh, idea of um, these indoor outdoor spaces so they're covered but unconditioned something we can do quite easily in Southern California and these spaces are chill out spaces spaces to eat spaces for crits so there's a lot of this kind of indeterminate both climatically and programmatic um, kinds of spaces in the building additional um, covered yards are flexible spaces for sculpture production really driven by efficiency and movement of materials and large sculpture across the continuous floor plate of the plan. And these large volumetric spaces allow students and goods to be moved around the building um, while still having a close connection to the city through those large openings. A very inexpensive building, so really it's searching for where to find detail. And um, in this case, the only real detail is cast into the mold of the tilt-up wall and then just the simple cornice such that um, what really brings, articulates the detail is the inter interaction of light and shadow. So this really almost becomes like a film screen throughout the course um, of the day and the way light falls on those pillows. And then in the warehouse that we adapted, very light frame construction, we imagine that this, this neighborhood of, of individual artist studios could change over time, so very cheap and indeterminate in the way that the plant, the, all the walls are kept lower at 10 feet. So you always have a sense of that communal space. And then those studios transform into exhibition spaces twice a year during open studios. Other shared crit spaces um, afford different scales um, of com communal space within the building. And there it sits um, kind of anonymously in the fabric of the Hayden track. Uh, at UIC, this is um, our competition entry for a new performing arts building, so again, engaging a campus, but in this case sitting right at the edge, right at the freeway, so between the city um, and the campus. And it is, uh, has a theater and a performing arts hall, 
Um, so two very simple theater boxes that are connected by um, a unifying plinth, very low lying um, at the pedestrian scale, but very porous at the same time. So while the massing of the two theaters is quite prominent, it's very informal and transparent at the base. It's unified by what we call a winter garden, so it can open up in, in the certain off seasons, daylight filled, very, very flexible, so musicians can play, artists can do work in here in addition to um, the performing arts students. Um, and so that in between, between the theater bo box and the envelope is, is largely driven by um, conditions of daylighting, um, air evacuation, the sort of chimney effect. And um, if this works, it's just a simple little uh, animation that looks at how the building transforms from reading as a kind of slightly crystalline reflective mass to something that glows and is quite transparent and open um, across, the, uh, across the course of the day. Uh, and then um, the, in another arts building at Rice University, another competition, here um, the arts are really growing at Rice and so this is a new kind of precinct of the campus so right next to the Moody Center for some of you that might know the campus. And we thought that what was interesting about this project for us, it was bringing together all the disciplines, um, maybe not dissimilar to the Sam Fox School, into one, into one building. So undergraduate and grad, sculpture, architecture, painting, photography. But we really thought about it almost like a kind of work palace, that it had all this intense um, activity happening within um, a kind of industrial um, warehouse. As, an, as a building on the edge of campus, each facade is quite different, so it's responding to both campus buildings and residential buildings. So it has a kind of urbanism in the way that each facade um, speaks directly to those different conditions. Um, brick is obviously a dominant material at Rice, so um, working within uh, a language of almost thinking of um, different like textile approaches to way, the way that we could um, man, uh, manage the brick and respond to these uh, the different urban conditions along um, the campus. And I think what's fascinating for us about you know both campus buildings and buildings in the city is really not only the building themselves but the spaces they activate around them. So, for example, this alley next to Moody that is now a kind of production space for students. It's a, it was proposed as a film theater. So we love that way in which buildings kind of build energy and the way that they establish fabric and connectivity um, within a campus. Within the building, it's really a factory-like environment, um, very flexible. Of course, daylight drives many of um, the decisions and the building systems um, and skylights. And um, lastly, uh, a competition for a small, probably the smallest campus we've ever worked on. Um, it's called uh, Torcato di Tela, it's in Buenos Aires. So it's a courtyard campus. We were um, selected to work on the third of four buildings. Um, it's next to a, uh, a very important soccer stadium in um, Buenos Aires. So it's, on the one hand, a very casual, nice residential neighborhood, but every time there's a soccer game, it's this very raucous, intense urbanism. So there's a kind of defense, defensive way that we had to think about the perimeter of the building. So this is the existing condition. Um, of the two existing buildings, and ours was here on the south side of that courtyard. Uh, so I, th I think for us, um, this is a, a, a really fast-growing university. It's founded on the arts and technology, and so this new classroom, there's, I don't know the, the exact number, but there's a really large number of students here. It's very um, dynamic. They are, they're sometimes rent out space for other um, uses. So we, our building is really thought of, it's a concrete building thought of almost like a kind of scaffold or a piece of infrastructure. And the, it, the north facing um, is an open gallery, so it's the opposite. So north in Buenos Aires is really the area where we're getting managing um, sun. So this gallery is a kind of stage in a way towards the courtyard. We um, create an open space between the existing buildings for a garden. So by having a narrow, long footprint, we welcome um, the garden, the plaza, and the park to the south. So these kind of slim gaps that cut through um, the edge of the, of the site are both places of entry, places of gardens between the city and the campus. Very simple classrooms that can adapt in many different ways depending on how um, the curriculum expands, um, hence the sort of scaffolding approach. 
and an idea of an informal garden, that this is a classroom, it's a circulation space, it's a space for artists to activate as a kind of additional classroom space. And then facing the south um, to, the, to the plaza, na navigating that public realm with an intimate um, campus building was, was um, playing with how that, that grid infrastructure could um, have a more discreet facade on the south. So uh, I think like many architects, we, our office really uh, suffers from the casualty of losing competitions mm -hmm. or competitions we won and then it was not built for many reasons, so, but this is one of them. But once in a while, you know, for students, you know, I think it's important to have thick skin. Mm -hmm. And once in a while, many years later, you know, sometimes a dream of a lost competition comes back or you know, certain things that you studied and experimented is applicable in different ways to other projects. And then when those moments happen, it's like, Remembering your first love is really special. <laughs> but uh, that's why I say to myself. But, uh, so this is, this is a project in West Philadelphia. This, we want this competition uh, for uh, a Philadelphia Contemporary. This is a, a non-collecting Kunz Halle type of space. Uh, it's situated at the intersection of uh, UPenn and uh, Drexel University. They have a new tech uh, corridor, you know. And then, but it also borders on two uh, African-American neighborhoods, Mantua and Palton, you know. So the, uh, the, not only in the beginning, of course, like many times we study the building types, these are the institutional types of both Penn and, and Drexel, but also the, the type of buildings that are in this neighbor, neighborhood, you know. What, is, what, is the, what does it mean to build a building at the intersection of, of this neighbor, these neighborhoods? You know, so um, I, I think we are working with the, the, the director and the curators. You know, we were very involved in the programming of this because we knew that uh, it would take a long time to fundraise for this building. And how does, uh, how could Philadelphia Contemporary has a presence in the city during those years before they have an institution? They have been, without a permanent space, they have been uh, incubated by different institutions. So the, the concept is to, have these pavilions, you know, whether it's pavilions for exhibitions or artist commission uh, pavilions to be activated throughout the city. And then well, finally, when the, buildings, uh, when the building is done, these pavilions could come back to the mothership, you know. So the concept of the, of the building is really this very simple and expansible box, but with a series of what we call tables. And on these tables are these pavilions. You know, some of them, uh, for example, we call the types of old water towers on top of buildings, but a, a lot of them were planned to be used for the community, whether it's a DJ booth or a harbor space for a local bike shop on the ground floor or a kitchen for a barbecue. You know? So this notion of participating in the neighborhood as, uh, or the, the building as a scaffold for these pavilions were, were the main concept of this. And, and we, uh, we have always been interested in the half timber type of construction. Uh, historically in Europe, that was built out of timber, but we are translating it as a frame, a steel frame construction. So it's, uh, this is the initial scheme when it's really expressed on the exterior of the building, extended towards these, to form these tables uh, as a subsequent platform for these pavilions. Um, later on, there was a translucent skin that was, that was added onto it, and very rough and, and unfinished uh, spaces in the interior, whether it's the lobby, the public space, educational spaces that extends out onto these tables or one of these pavilions. Uh, one of them is a camera obscura, um, uh, or more traditional type of uh, or black box spaces or gray spaces to more traditional type of top lit galleries. Um, so it's in a, in, a, in a rough neighborhood. We really wanted to make an industrial building that is quite muscular in some ways, uh, but also very open. Um, this is, a, a, this is a, a, only a, a conceptual study that we are commissioned for. Uh, this is for the a Museum of Contemporary Art, designed by Arata Isosaki on Grand Avenue in, uh, in Los Angeles. And those who know the city, uh, this was one of the first buildings on this, right now is this cultural corridor, and all the lots are really completed. But when that building was built, it was like a ship on a dry dock. There was nothing around, you know. And uh, now, you know, you see, you know, there's the concert hall, the cathedral, the Copimo Blau School, the Coburn, the Broads, all completed. But at the, at the beginning, 1986, this was how the, the whole site looks like. You know, Isosaki designed this building there with red sandstone. A lot of the moves that were made for this building, like you have to, 
you have to descend into a courtyard. At that time, they were anticipating there were a lot of commercial uh, uh, retail spaces around, so they don't want the museum to block the view. You know? So a lot of these rules uh, that has subsequently changed. So this is how it looks today, you know, how the building over time, there was a, a space frame that was added on top, uh, all these new buildings around. And this was the original drawing by Isasaki. You know, it was really like a building in a desert, you know, this kind of Giorgio de Chirico-esque long shadows, you know, with pure geometry, Euclidean uh, uh, barrel vaults and, and pyramids and spheres. And, and for us, this was like the reality, you know. <laughs> so, so or the reality today, you know. So when we were commissioned to, number one, to design the project in two stages, one is to improve the building circulation, and the second is to consider how to add on new galleries into this building. So for us, it's a very subtractive move. It's really like taking out things that were added on later, and then adding new things to it, like for example, a wall that defines the sculptural courtyard. You know, right now, the, the sculptural courtyard doesn't have an edge. It leaks towards a hotel with a co coffee shop, things like that, just to do certain things that are quite invisible, but to tighten up the space itself, or just even moving the restaurant from, from the sunken courtyard to above, so you don't walk past food before you encounter art, small things like that. And then the second stage is really to think of adding two extra galleries on top. It was a very hard project for us because it's, uh, it's such a, um, uh, uh, a specific geometry, you know, so it's such a completed geometry, it's so hard to add on. We kind of found the, for us, we found the Rosetta Stone with these skylights uh, from a house that Isosaki designed in Venice Beach around the same time he designed the museum. You know, it's basically, it's almost like if you take one bay on the right, that was the house itself. It was a rectangle, rectangular box that he cut the two edges. So it looks like, the frontal view looks like a gable roof house, but actually it's skylights that, that it's for a private gallery. So we basically took that and began to multiply it as a way of thinking of how we can carve in the corner. So almost like going back to the language of the author to find something that would be adaptable, agreeable to the original building. And we, we're quite happy with this solution in terms of how it's something different, but also works quite well with the geometry of the building. Of course, we intended to have the same red sandstone to cover the building. So to somehow we th thought someone in the future could come back and look at this building. They didn't quite know which one was the original, which one was the new addition. Um, Um, this is another building that we designed a master plan for. This is the uh, uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, uh, designed by Josef Paul Kleihus um, from Berlin. And this building was finished in 2000, uh, sorry, 1996, 10 years after MoCA in Los Angeles. And you know, we're, of, like all projects, we're trying to understand the context of where this is in relationship to other art institutions in Chicago. Um, uh, it's, you know, Kai Hu's language really, on one hand, um, you know, followed this Germanic Shinko Perseus tradition of uh, like the Altus uh, National Gallery built on a base, long stairs, you know, and, and together with his contemporary language of the grid and such. And uh, it was not a popular museum, you know, it's very cold, you know, the, the stairs are you won't have to ascend to worship the art. And, and you know, for us, it's really thinking about how to open up a lot of the spaces in there, but do it in an almost surgical way. So we did a, a, like many of these type of studies where the, the, like in, inside there's this kind of ship-shaped stair that's actually quite beautiful, but a series of before and after, how we can open up the complete like basement you know, as a, from a storage educational space to a public area. You know, these small moves, like we study the circulation, it's a symmetrical plan, but it's asymmetrical type of circulation, how we can almost introduce these type of points of acupuncture, of connection, that evens out the circulation. You know, so uh, of this whole master plan, the first phase was realized, this was before, this was after. It entails opening up the floor, but also adding new floors on certain double height spaces. So in, in a way, increasing the contrast between the, the double or triple height spaces. So here you see you know, what happened with the new floor that was added as an educational floor, uh, working with artists like Pedro and Juana to do these uh, uh, ceiling installation in the public space, and also creating like, new stairs that on one hand it's its own language, but also responds to the geometry of a Klaihu stair at the same time. You know? 
we're happy that this stair somehow are often used by, by artists' performances. You know, and this stair leads down to the restaurant, and this type of open space is almost like a living room. You know, so students are there, you know, internet connection to the, the theater, and also opening up this space like a vault uh, 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 or crypt under a classical building. Uh, we are here, we work with Chris Ophelia, the English artist, to not only do a series of murals, but also working with the fabric of the furniture. Uh, we also design a, a future addition to it uh, that will connect to the park. Um, right now, the park is isolated. So in a way, creating a different type of lobby, a much larger lobby connected to the lake, the park and the lake, you know, but also taking the same dimension of the grid that Clay has used. So while the, the, the original building will be much more porous in the base, the new addition on the backside basically takes the same module, have a, have a, a, a really tall atrium in the middle, and uh, contrast the heaviness of the geometry with a much lighter material, in, in this case, aluminum. We were quite beguiled by the um, SOM's Inland Steel Building that is more than 70 years old now, but how the panels that used to be so taut begins to oil can a little bit. You know, it's almost begins to reflect the sun in a somehow quite endearing way. So we're thinking of uh, creating this type of lightness for the skin itself. Um, and this uh, next project is a project that we just started. Uh, this is a, a renovation of the Kunstmuseum in Basel. Uh, this is a museum that has the uh, oldest public art collection in the world. You know, um, The building is on the right, uh, about 10 years or so, a little bit less than 10 years on the left. Uh, there was a new addition designed by Chris Gantenbein, Basel office that's connected underground. Uh, the old building was designed by Rudolf Chris and Paul Bonatz, 1936. Um, so uh, this is the old building, and then the new building, you see a glimpse of it on the left. Uh, typically, in the new building are the more contemporary art exhibitions. The old building has the more, they have an incredible Holbein collection, for example. And so a lot of the work is really about adding small things to it, like there's no, not, no opening on this wall, how we add this new connection to a cafe, to this is the courtyard. The wall that you see on the ground floor was blank in front of the Rodans. How we inserted a bookstore in there so it, it parallels the transparency to the courtyard as well as opening up that, that deck on the top to make that public. Yeah. So, so a lot of it is really about preserving the latent classicism of the building but increase new type of transparencies like this connection that not used to be there um, to uh, 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 a connection to a rear courtyard, a new, new public space around the rear courtyard connected to a theater, uh, to foyer spaces that connects to the museum or to the gallery spaces. Um, and then this is the, the, the roof deck that I talked about. And also new types of galleries that didn't have before, which is art spaces that are next to a window, you know, next to connected to an outdoor space. So as opposed to institutional spaces where the natural light tends to come from above, we're thinking very much about domestic spaces where the natural light comes laterally, you know, and the, the shadow and such. Of course, it has to be uh, a, a artwork that is uh, resistance to, to natural light. And how those spaces are connected to a new public uh, outdoor space, as well as expanding to the adjacent uh, uh, plot as a, a public sculpture garden. You know, so a lot of the work is like before and after uh, also creating new type of spaces that plays up the resonance to the existing spaces but suggests something new but not in a very uh, uh, loud way as well as this uh, bookstore that we are adding on that opens up that, trans that, that, that uh, increase the transparency to the wall to the courtyard. Great, so the last project we wanted to share um, with you is the Manil Drawing Institute. And I remember 10 years ago when I was here, um, we were just about to go to New York and debut the, just the images, the renderings of the project, and I wasn't able to share it. So it's nice to come back and, and share the project. Um, maybe some of you guys have been to Houston. But in any case, this is the campus um, in the Montrose area of Houston. And of course, um, hopefully everybody knows this building without me telling you, which is um, Renzo Piano's Manila Collection building from, the, from 1987. And um, uh, Renzo worked with Dominique de Manil um, to design this building that sits within a pretty magical campus of 30 acres, nested among residential buildings that we call affectionately bungalows. So it is this 
very magical um, intersection of domestic and institutional space. And so um, this was the campus, um, before we started our project, uh, David Chipperfield had done a master plan. And so when he began his work, he was studying this uh, 30 acres that is in, uh, represented here in this slide. And I think like um, many of the kind of sites that we've, we've shown you guys tonight, I mean, this one is holistic and really controlled largely by one client. But so it's, it's not just one singular iconographic art institution, but it's really a constellation of buildings. The mothership is, of course, um, the Manil collection, but Renzo himself did a number of other buildings like the Twombly Pavilion, the Rothko Chapel, um, on the, on the uh, St. Thomas campus, Philip Johnson did a number of important buildings. Um, Francois de Manil did the Byzantine Chapel. So it's, I think, a, a kind of art urbanism or neighborhood for art as um, Rainer Banham talked about the Manil campus. And sort of in between those institutional buildings are the fabric buildings. These bungalows, largely owned by the Manil, subtly transformed. Um, some are institutional spaces for them. Others are just residential buildings or commercially leased. So it has this sort of magical, um, understated quality um, where you're not quite sure where you might encounter art or um, elements of the museum. So these are um, but kind of befores uh, from Chipperfield's master plan. And then this was his proposal where the large um, uh, apartment building was torn down that the Manils had, had bought and largely funded much of their work over the years. So reimagining the south side of the campus as a mixed use um, development along the rail line and then opening up the southern part of the campus. And so the Drawing Institute was the first building that was built from that master plan. It's the sort of purple building in the middle and um, pretty much in the geographic center of the building, of the campus, sorry. And so, you know, for us, when we thought about, it's a relatively small building, about 30,000 square feet. It's both, you know, needed to serve the program that we were given for the, the Drawing Institute, but we also saw it as a sort of living room in the middle of the campus. It gets um, very hot in Houston, and so we, we sort of imagined that as a kind of in-between condition programmatically. Um, so the site itself nestles right up to these bungalows that you see, and there were a number of existing trees that were left over that Dominique had actually planted in the apartment building parking lot. And so our, we began by literally just being very direct and framing courtyards around some of those existing trees and then imagining how the building could infill itself in a very quiet way around those green rooms. So this was kind of before and then after, where um, we sit kind of at the edge of the main necklace, as it's called, that frames the open space around the Manila collection, and the Drawing Institute sits in front of a new green that is sort of the future of the campus. And we worked uh, with the landscape architect, Michael Van Balkenberg, on this project. So not only did we do the Drawing Institute building, there's an open green space, and then we, which used to be the energy house, and we did a new energy house that allows um, for the first time for, for us to see the Twombly building as a kind of building in the round, opening up the south elevation. So that was really a key part of the sort of urbanism of our little precinct. Um, so here's the Drawing Institute um, along what's called West Main, a new street, um, the Rothko Chapel, and then a kind of special relocation of a number of Michael Heiser um, uh, uh, drawings in the ground, as he calls them. Um, so kind of a, a beautiful complement as a kind of sculptural project. So here, I think just to say that the Drawing Institute, here is those three courtyards. And then this back building, as, it, as we sort of think about it, is houses um, uh, the conservation lab, um, the drawing study room, the gallery is at the front face of the building along West Main, adjacent to the east and west courtyards, and then the scholar courtyard and the administrative offices are to the north. So from the south, the building is, is relatively mute. It's really a porch to this new garden um, with a subtle uh, hint of the two courtyards on the east and west side. Now we've come around to the north side, looking south from Twombly, um, and what you enter, so one of the, I think the big challenges for us in the project was both about scale. It's a 30 acre campus. You're entering into a 30,000 square foot building. So there's a kind of intimacy, not only in scale, but in terms of the works on view. And in addition to that, um, lighting is, is a really key challenge of a, of a museum dedicated to drawings, which is a really uh, relatively unprecedented building type. And so we both wanted to use the courtyard to create an intermediate scale in terms of um, a garden in the campus, 
but also um, use it as a way to modulate light from the 10,000 foot candles of bright Texas sun into the gallery, which is about five foot candles. So without any mechanical means, we're able to do that through structure and, and tree canopy. Um, I think the idea of this, this the, the West Garden, is that it's um, framed by the courtyard. It's a 12-foot wide bay, so it's very generous. There's a lot of rain in Houston, so it's really an outdoor room, but it's also a space you can pass across. Kids play here. It's a very informal space. Um, it's really uh, a meeting room and, um, and a part of a larger campus. In terms of materials, it's a very simple palette. With we spent a lot of time looking both at Renzo's building and the surrounding um, vernacular. In this case, it's also, um, it's called Port Orford Cedar. In this case, as, as in contrast to the horizontal um, kind of lap boards of the Manila collection and many of the houses, we laminated um, kind of handcrafted new boards that are laminated together. They're, they become shipped to us in, in two foot wide boards and then they're they're bead blasted so that the um, texture of the grain comes out. We get rid of some of the pulp and then it's just simply oiled. And that dark color is also part of the light calibration. And then in contrast to that are the steel um, plates that both form um, part of the spanning structure and cladding. And I, I think one of the things that was important to us, it's a very thin roof, it's eight inches and in some cases spans 60 feet. So the ribbing is part of the stiffening of the structure. But the way that the, some of those ribs telegraph uh, through brings a kind of imperfection that um, both, uh, I think, echoes back to the, the roughness almost of Renzo's building, but also modulates light in a beautiful way and has a kind of humanness about it that um, was quite important to us as we were testing in the mock-up. So now we're looking directly east-west into what is called the living room, the main entry. We've entered the building and we're looking back out. So despite being a, a building that needs to be very protective of its contents, you're always kind of reoriented back to the landscape and to daylight. So this is the living room and it's largely used um, without any, any artificial light on. So the folds of the roof, which are part of a kind of module that's similar to the uh, proportion and form of the courtyards, here um, meets at an apex, which, which echoes um, you know, the residential buildings that surround us but it's also really well calibrated through for daylighting um, so that the folds of the roof modulate light. Um, and then when we do need artificial light, they project from the top of one wall across. So it's really about reflect, reflective light. And here we're looking east and you're also catching a glimpse through those uh, doorways to the scholar courtyard to the north. So the galleries on the south, the scholar study centers to the, uh, to the north. This is a view just looking south into the galleries and how the folds in the roof uh, support kind of different specific art installations. In the, in the gallery itself, proportioned for drawings, works on paper, I think that was, it's a building design for a collection, which is a unique opportunity in museum design. And I, one of the things that was um, a, a kind of important curatorial and art historical kind of debate in the project was really trying to define what a drawing is, what is the bounds of scale of a drawing. And so in the end, the decision, you know, there's a kind of average size of the works in the collection, and which is quite small, like 18 by 24. So we, we calibrated the scale of this room to support a certain scale, knowing that larger works would be um, in the main building. And so we, we didn't want to design a building that could work for everything and end up being kind of generic in scale and proportion. Here's a, now we're looking north towards the scholar courtyard, so the garden comes back into view. A different scale of planting. Um, this is a space for, for work and circulation and contemplation. Much more linear light, kind of light from these magnolia trees. Um, it's really a, um, a light show in the courtyard. Uh, and then really the heart of the building is the study, study room, the place where scholars and students um, and artists can come and look at works firsthand. So there is top lits, um, Daylight in this room, it's the, this and the conservation lab are the only spaces in the building with top light because works on paper are so delicate, but very simple systems to calibrate um, or even completely shut out all of that light. And this is the conservation um, laboratory and study room. And I think this is one of the first times that um, a study center and a conservation lab were put together. Really those two functions happened together. And so um, I think that was some of the important learning as we toured buildings and kind of understood the, the challenges of a building dedicated to drawings. 
So these kind of, this is part of a, an annex, um, a moment where you can look back out to see the campus and reorient yourself. Um, the, the living room, once again, set up in more of a kind of study orientation with um, tables that we design specific for this room. But it also is as designed to be a place for art as well, works that are less delicate than works on paper. And the Manila's done a lot of different activations with wall drawing. So it's really now become a gallery that um, has a, a separate exhibition program. The East Courtyard is a little bit more green, uh, a little bit more residential feeling. And as you zoom out and start to circulate around the building, that porch comes back into view. And I think what was important for us, thinking, looking at a view like this, that we imagined um, in having those two courtyards and being able to sort of circulate around the south part of the building that many folks might just pass through, walking their dog, meeting a friend, that it has that informality. And, and perhaps over time, as you get to know the building, you might, you might enter. But um, I think that's what we mean when we talk about not only you know, designing the building as its standalone figure, but understanding how it shapes um, space around it as part of a continuous landscape. Um, I think a special tradition of the Manil is as, um, the, donor, the donor piece. And so um, as a kind of commemoration of each project, an artist is commissioned to do a site-specific work. And this is one of um, Ellsworth Kelly's last works. It's called the Manil Curve. So that sits on the west facade of the building. Uh, I think these images sort of capture that kind of in-between quality, um, both in terms of space and light, um, some snapshots from people um, that have captured kind of nice views, new, new angles for the project that we, um, we enjoy seeing through different channels on social media and such. Um, and you know, I think what's also important in this kind of quality of in-betweenness, um, how light changes in the building. So it, in the evening, um, the building feels much more like a lantern. And you know, I think just to conclude, um, uh, we, we were talking early about Aldo Van Eyck and how important um, his ideas and the, the Wheels of Heaven project and this, this twilight condition, a kind of in-between, between, between building and landscape, between inside and outside. Um, these are you know, qualities we strive for in all of our work, but I think the chance um, to work through these ideas for in this building um, at the Mineral Collection was really a, a, great, a great gift. And um, you know, we're really happy that it's finished, Mark and I were just back there. It's kind of taken on a life of its own. And, um, and anyway, so 10 years later, back at WashU, building is done. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for um, joining us tonight. Do we take some questions? Yeah. Compl compliments. Critiques. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, it's, sorry. Like, it's really interesting how you started out with yeah. houses and mm -hmm. uh, at a certain scale and level of detail. Um, what are some of the challenges of kind of moving from the residential scale to the larger institutional scale? Well, I think, you know, on the one hand, um, you know, the. Um, I think there's many different ways to answer that question, but I, I, I think going back to what I said is the reason why we work at those different scales is that we find the sort of directness and the intimacy of a house is, you know, we're, we're, always, we're always designing for people, I mean, for most projects. And so when one feels, one feels comfortable and intimate in one's house, we think those are relevant questions and qualities of space that you should feel in a classroom or in a school or in a museum. And so, that's why we like to work at both scales. I think the house, there's a sort of immediacy of how one works with a client, mostly on a residential project. And sometimes on institutional projects, it's just more institutionalized, it's more complicated, it's more layered. And I think being able to, um, co be co being comfortable working in that direct way with, with clients is I think a skill that we, I mean, something we value a lot and how we work with our clients and we, sort of try to demand that and instill it across all those scales. Um, yeah, I don't know, maybe there's other things we could answer. About I mean, that. I remember um, Fumihiko Maki, you know, um, the lecture six, seven years ago. He ended with a critique of the um, Olympic Stadium designed by Saha Hadi. Not so much the project itself, but the whole competition basically only asked for an aerial view. 
And he said for him, it was contradictory to his, him, his education as a student understood that five foot is the way to gauge uh, uh, the, something a bit abstract on human scale. I thought that was a very interesting thought, mm -hmm. you know, because I remember so like the elevation or the elevation, like the where your your the, the height of your eye mm -hmm. in relationship to connect them to something abstract. I remember I think it was in Charlottesville tape. There was a debate between Kevin Roach and um, Michael Graves, you know, about abstraction and figuration. And I think Kevin Roach talked about maybe beyond three stories or more. Abstraction could be daunting, you know, that you, you lose that sense of uh, if it's just an abstract shape, you know, if it's two or three stories, you can still see it, you know, larger than you, monumental, but still you can relate to that human scale. But if you take that and blow it up ten floors, you know, it's a different story. I thought it was an interesting moment. And we don't have a formula, you know, but I think it's so dependent on the project and the context. But I think for us, we always think about, like, I mean, I think for students, so you think about when, do you, when is the building completed for you? And, and for us, it's very different. You know, I remember our first ground-up house in Marfa, uh, the first time I saw it, before it was occupied, it was early in the morning, a sun hits it, you cast a shadow, and I thought, wow, this is finished. This is, the building is there. Uh, some buildings, you don't feel it's there until it was occupied. You see people using it, you feel, oh, the building is finished. The minute when the art was in, I felt it. The art was that it reminded you why you belabored, you know, eight years for this building, and that was the reason. You know, I think those moments are important. You know, understanding the scale, and I think we try to always keep that in mind in terms of how does it relate to the person? Is it the occupation? Is it the art? What is it for? You know, I think that kind of gives the life and the reason for occupation for these projects. You know, oh, Robert. Please. I'm going to ask Art. I mean, I, for, for, first of all, thank you for that observation. I mean, Robert, your work we have respected for, for so long, and just hearing your coming from you means a lot to us. I, I, uh, I think we always, um, you know, for us, we always um, use the analogy of a, a chess game, you know, for, for designing buildings, you know. So it's less about the chess piece or the move, but how do you create a beautiful game? So sometimes when you, when, when you insert a piece, how do you make someone else, how do you ingratiate your surroundings as opposed to overwhelming it? Mm -hmm. Now certainly, not all sites or not all contexts are not all are, are incredible. You know, sometimes these are, sometimes they're nothing, you know, and 
there's no reason to find the genus loci of a parking lot, you know. <laughs> but your building is what makes the context, you know, for us. You know, so sometimes we have to play chess in a defensive way, and sometimes we have to go for checkmate, you know. And I, I think oftentimes in the single family houses, a lot of them were uh, uh, neighborhoods that were in transition, you know. So we actually know that what we do will actually activate what will happen later, you know. Whereas in the Manil, you know, Renzo already made a move, Pansati Vanille made a move. We were interested in making a move in response to that. Also interested in how the next architect will make the, the next move. You know, how do we create this beautiful game? So for us, the Manil project, for example, were very much, um, you know, we find a scale between the pre-war houses and Renzo's mothership, you know, even lower than the, the Twombly building. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think also, um, you know, make, um, sorry, I, I, I was just thinking about, you know, the art spaces and how, I mean, it's either sometimes it's existing architecture and it's also creating um, works that are backdrops for other things, both programmatically, and I think that is also, you know, informs how we think about the sort of level of expression of, of the architecture. And I also think we always, uh, the, the type of buildings that interest us are, are buildings that not necessarily scream out, you know, for attention. Oftentimes there's a kind of mystique to them but makes you do a double take. And then it probes you, know, you go deeper, it tells, it, it tells you a lot, you know. I think these are the tendency or the type of buildings that we're attracted to. So I think oftentimes we try to embody that quality you know, we often think of buildings as like great friends. You know, they could leave, let you be quiet and silent if, they, if you want to, but when you're engaged, they can tell you a lot, you know. So I think having that quality is something that we inspire in our buildings. Ah, uh, yes, hi. Thank you. How, I mean, how do we resolve? Oh, you're the boss. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I think we um, we try to start each project without a sort of predetermined idea. So already there's sort of no tension on the table. And I think we also try to, you know, I mean, we're very interested in structure. We're very interested in material. We're very interested in climate and atmosphere. And so we, we almost try to start each project with separate tracks of research. So there's, there's a lot of flow in these different lines of research. And then usually, kind of just because that's how things go, there's moments where things start aligning and we start mm -hmm. to see sort of synergy between a structural idea and a light idea. And so I think we're always searching for those moments of connection as opposed to mm -hmm. starting from solving tension. We, mm -hmm. we allow things to exist kind of in different layers of research and then look for those moments where things come together. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think we also, you know, we have a great team and we, um, try to work a lot at the beginning of each project so that we can sort of see things before us without sort of saying, you're right, I'm wrong. I mean, it's more like just putting things on the table and everyone's there to debate it. So I think those are kind of two key parts of, of our work process. Yeah, I think this teamwork and being participatory is important for us. I, I think we always aspire to, we also have a, a mutual respect, whether it's, you know, the founders, people work with us for 15 years, or someone who is new, everyone is equal on the table when we design. And we try to have a certain respect with one another, I always aspire to the enlightenment when the philosophers really you know, have a certain decorum and respect for each other. And because of that baseline, you can afford to have strong disagreements. You know? So at the end, it's not either your idea or my idea, but when it's something that's so inevitable, everyone agrees upon. You know? So I think we try to be very rational and really make decisions based on principle, especially design design positions. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? <laughs> you had your hand before. <laughs> 
No, 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 no questions. It's a bummer. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, just to say um, that, you know, I think we're always um, looking back at our work and trying to see it in fresh ways. And so, you know, we're always trying to learn from both the things that didn't happen and the things that did. And, you know, experiences like putting lectures together like this, they're always a chance to see new relationships between work. And I think, I mean, that's what keeps you going because there's so many obstacles um, as an architect. You know, there's so many losses and roadblocks and challenges. And, you know, you, you, you certainly need to be an optimist. You need to really believe in the project and be really open. Sometimes a loss is a win, you know, next year because you learn something in that moment that you can apply again. And I think that kind of openness to how one takes on each project is really important because it allows you to keep those ideas orbiting around and they'll land when they're ready to land and with the right people and the right client. You know, there's so many conditions that need to align to actually win a project and realize it. such a good point. Absolutely. I think this is absolutely an important question and an important point. And, and mm -hmm. certainly many uh, architects have much longer careers than we do. And, but I think how to manage, you know, to un understand architecture as a long distance race mm -hmm. and how to manage your pace that there will be inevitable disappointments, but you don't want to accumulate it to a point where it, you get into hemorrhage or depression that you can't get back out of it, you know. Because there are arcs of architecture, architects' career who went into this downward spiral and they just, hopefully they can build a Holocaust museum that could take them out from, it would never happen. Maybe it happened to one, but didn't happen to 999. So I think how to manage that, that, that pace, you know, and you can take setbacks and look for ways out to get out of it, uh, from both from a professional and a creative way. I mean, I think we oftentimes try to look at other disciplines or other professions and how they deal with it. I remember Jodie Foster, the actress, said, don't focus on roles you didn't get, focus on the ones you had. And just for me, it's, it was something parallel, just like, okay, it's love lost, page is turned, how do I focus on the next one? And maybe I can revisit that when I have a critical distance. You know. I mean, I think also yeah. part of having diverse yeah. types of work, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lack of maybe efficiency about that. You get really good at one thing, you just keep doing it. And, but, you know, I think to be able to do um, 
an installation with an artist and then do a museum and do, you know, these things give you energy and they give you knowledge and they, and they just change the cycle of how you're thinking about your work. And I think that um, keeps that intensity going without it hurting, you know. Great. Hey, oh, thank, so thank you again. Did oh. you have one question? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> shy, shy hand. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, yes. yeah. I know that's a great question because I think clients are involved in different capacities. You know, they have different needs, and it's very important because without a client, there's no product. We're not. We don't create things out of hot air. You know, so understanding the client's needs are very important. Sometimes your client doesn't have any maybe aesthetic predilection. Sometimes they want it to done on time, on budget, and that's very important. You know, so there's certain things, but I think oftentimes it's about creating a communication with your client because it's their project, you know. So you have the responsibility of making it into physical form. They're not, they not your patron as an artist, you know, they're not commissioning you to do a project. Maybe sometimes they have, but very few, you know. So it's really about finding common ground, I think is important. Mm -hmm. You know, finding yeah. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that, I mean, I, you know, partly our work as teachers, I mean, we see our clients as collaborators, but we also sometimes, there's a lot of education and learning that one needs, we need to bring to projects. I mean, a lot of times clients don't have mm -hmm. the knowledge to know how to make decisions. So looking at history, looking at project precedents, really building mm -hmm. shared understanding is a really key part of the success that we find in our own work. I mean, oftentimes clients, come to us because they know that we have that kind of engagement. Um, that's not every client, but um, I think finding that together is really mm -hmm. builds trust, and I think trust is also a really important part of that exchange. I mean, also, Robert earlier mentioned, you know, architecture is not about creating heroic forms. I think it also came from that tradition, uh, the 20th century avant-garde tradition that you know, avant-garde is already a military term in the past where the kamikaze goes out and dies and opens up the road for the, the army to come through. You know, it, it has this kind of idea that this is something that it comes from the sky, and this is, this is, genius. You know, this is my genius. You know? and, and it's not that. You know? and, and we also, we don't have kamikazes anymore. It's like suicide bombers. You know, we, I, I think like a Trojan horse is more interesting because you get to live. You know? <laughs> you know, finding something. Sometimes you need a Trojan horse as something to mediate between what you believe what the site is and what the client needs to do, what the city needs to do. There's so many players on board. How do you tell that story that, or tell a series of stories mm -hmm. that unite the whole group together is the challenge of the architect. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Please. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not an architect or a director. No, no. Well, you know, in the U.S., it's much less collective housing, you know, than in many other places like in Europe or South America. Kenneth Frampton talked about U.S. not having this moment of, or Scandinavia not having this moment of rupture. It's much easier to live next to one another. And uh, uh, I, I can share with you, I, I lived in Switzerland for a few years, and I was surprised, at first I was surprised by the quality, how well the quality of construction was there. Then I realized the cost of construction there is more than three times that of US. And I was surprised, how come like someone in their 30s or 40s would commission even a pay architects to do a competition for a single family house? And they, they plan to live there for the rest of their life and pass it on to their kids. And, I, and I, it's such a different culture in the US. Oftentimes, 
clients wants to build as, as cheap as possible. They want it to get the highest profit when they move out in three years or five years. It's always about upward mobility, generally speaking. You know? And then I realized later on in, Swiss, in the case of Switzerland that um, a lot of these cantons or states, you actually, there's, you pay a much higher uh, Gemeinde tax, which is like a neighborhood tax, you know, than the state tax or the federal tax. So in other words, if you wanted to, you live in this neighborhood, you want to build a kindergarten, the neighborhood votes for it. And then, okay, we pay more taxes. You want to build a new road, neighborhood decides. It's a very small area. So I could imagine, if you lived in this neighborhood, you pay for the school, you pay for the road, why do I want to move? I want my kids to benefit from it. I want my grandchildren to benefit from it. So I'm not saying it's not an architecture problem, but understanding the desire of why you want to stay in a place, whether it's on your own or collectively that actually affects architecture or the quality of architecture is important. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and oftentimes the opportunities that came to us with collective housing are oftentimes something that is transitional. You know, you know, not, not social housing, but transitional. So someone who goes there for a short period of time and eventually move on to a single family house. And I, I'm not sure how long it takes for this whole single family house dream to be more diversified here. But I mean, yeah. also just very directly, yeah. um, in the past year mm -hmm. and a half, we've started working on mm -hmm. um, uh, large residential towers. Um, and, you know, I think we, I mean, part of maybe why we haven't had the chance to do it before is related somehow to what Mark was talking about in the culture of Switzerland, which is that in America, it's a very sort of risk averse situation. So we've never done it before. We weren't really going to be asked to do it. But um, we were brought to these projects by folks that are um, involved in culture. And so they're partnering with the developer. And what they're bringing to it is quality architecture and also you know, investing in kinds of spaces that are part of the shared amenities of these buildings that are about gardens, that are about art, that are about these things that build culture in the city. So there aren't very many of those kind of people around. And so we're. Um, you know, we, we're, hope that we're hopeful about these projects and, you know, it's a great, we really believe in the role of, um, of housing um, and want the chance to think about that in, in, in American cities because most of our other housing projects have been in Europe that we've been part of. So it's, um, there's not a lot of great examples though at, at, the, at the kind of scale of, of building um, that you're talking about. I mean, of course there's, you know, great Pritzker winning architects building apartments in Manhattan, but like that intermediate to lower scale is I think, you know, not um, a place where a lot of architects get to work and build great architecture. Great, thanks Thank for you. Questions. Thanks, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.